This is the Cato Daily Podcast for Thursday, June 2nd, 2022. I'm Caleb Brown. Facial recognition technology's benefits are pretty clear, but the drawbacks have truly just begun to be discovered, at least in this country. Cato's Matthew Feeney details the latest wrinkle in a technology that, for the most part, is not ready for prime time. Before we get into the nitty gritty here, what is the upside of facial recognition technology with specific respect to the private sector? There are many applications in the private sector. I I think many people would welcome if there were safeguards in place. For example, uh, cinema queues, lines to get into uh, airplanes, grocery stores, uh, these kind of security and payment measures where you could uh, have your face linked to a bank account or an identity and you could walk around the mall and have uh, your debit card automatically debited sounds uh, convenient and uh, an improvement on the status quo. Uh, However, I think a lot of people have understandable concerns about some of uh, facial recognition's other applications, especially when it comes to law enforcement. Yeah. So the upside, again, being able to just walk into a place and use your face, your immutable characteristic, eh, relatively mutable characteristic, um, your face as the ID, and just breeze through uh, whatever you need uh, from a store or whatever association you need to establish. Uh, It sounds great. Now, with respect to how that technology has already been abused, what do we know? Anyone worried about this technology should take uh, a look, I think, first at China, which is uh, the the country with a government that is uh, one of the most um, aggressive pursuers of this kind of technology. Um, they've demonstrated how effective facial recognition can be as a mass surveillance tool. And that is certainly a concern here in the United States. Uh, There have been widespread discussions across the country about whether the technology should be banned or not. And I I think these concerns are well-placed, especially given that about half of American adults are already in some kind of database that can be queried with facial recognition because uh, state DMVs volunteer driver's license photos to law enforcement. And what we have to fear here, I think, is given the ubiquitous nature of a lot of surveillance cameras and um, increasing use of body cameras, that we may just have to accept the fact that absent regulation or prohibition, that police will be able to identify us as we go about our business. Uh, And that's a concern, I think, with um, identification. But there are also concerns about other kinds of features of our lives that facial recognition or facial analysis tools can predict or identify. So, for example, there have been studies that have shown that facial analysis tools uh, are better at predicting sexual orientation of people than human beings. Uh, And there have been discussions of using facial analysis tools to determine uh, or to help diagnose um, children with autism. Uh, One of the more concerning applications of this kind of technology recently, uh, I think, is what's called gender uh, identity or gender recognition technology. Uh, And as anyone who has been paying attention to politics knows, uh, the uh, policy issues associated with trans, uh, with the trans community, are becoming uh, at the forefront of a lot of the the culture wars, and so I think that is a um, community that uh, has a vested interest in paying attention to that kind of technology in particular. Can you give me a use case where that would that abuse would uh, rear its ugly head? Right. So one is uh, uh, more embarrassing than an implication on civil liberties. Uh, A few years ago, the transport uh, provider in Berlin, Germany, decided that to uh, mark um, Equal Pay Day, it would provide women with a 21% discount for tickets on that day. And what would happen is that uh, Berlin residents would walk up to a kiosk and an automated system would determine whether the person standing at the kiosk was a man or a woman. And if you're a woman, would give you a discount. And this, uh, of course, is uh, potentially puts uh, members of the trans community in a potentially embarrassing situation because when you transition genders, the distance between your eyes does not change, nor does your the distance between nose and chin and, and other kinds of measurements that uh, are highly predictive of gender. Uh, human beings, like many other species, are 
sexually uh, dimorphic. Uh, there are differences between uh, the sexes. And um, although human beings might not be as good at picking these out as um, a lot of machines, the machines uh, are, are pretty accurate here. Uh, so that that example from Berlin is one where it might potentially be embarrassing. Uh, we also saw, though, a, a bit more of a concern with Clearview AI, uh, which is a facial recognition company, mostly known um, for its uh, selling of facial recognition tools to law enforcement, uh, patenting a technology that would allow for users to identify a person's uh, personal contact details or whether they uh, drink or not, whether they're homeless or not. And uh, you can imagine uh, that kind of technology with, uh, being implemented into dating apps, for example, where someone could scan someone's face to determine uh, gender, uh, potentially puts members of the trans community at risk of uh, at at worst, you know, physical assault, but um, also humiliation and embarrassment. Uh, we, we've seen recently the introduction of so-called bathroom bills. These are bills around uh, the, the country where lawmakers would like to ensure that people only visit bathrooms uh, associated with the gender they were assigned at birth. And there, I think we need to um, need to accept the fact that uh, violations of those those bills um, could be determined by these kind of automated systems. Some a, a private company or um, a government building could put a camera in front of bathrooms to determine uh, whether that uh, there's a violation or not. And there, I think you do um, have to accept that you're going to encourage more interactions uh, with the police, uh, which which has a whole host of issues associated with it. We libertarians, we liberals. Uh, value equality before the law, and uh, gender is one of those things that should be almost perfectly irrelevant when it comes to how the law treats you. Um, are there obvious cases where the government could be directly using this technology, or at least farming out, uh, authorizing some private sector entity to uh, engage in these kinds of checks directly for them? Right. Well, the first is an application where even liberals who support a relatively limited state would accept that the government has an interest in determining uh, gender identity or sex. Uh, and one is prisons, for example, where uh, people, I think, have persuasively argued uh, that, uh, that there are arguments for um, for gender discrimination in prisons. Uh, but the other we have to keep in mind is that if a state legislature makes something illegal, uh, the police department uh, or departments around the jurisdiction have an incentive uh, to investigate those crimes. And uh, this kind of technology could become something police add to their toolkit if the uh, law enforcement or if the local legislature decides to criminalize going to the wrong bathroom or, or something like that. And wh what I've thought about recently is that that uh, classical liberals uh i think have um a good position here to say that that we don't believe that the state is the best venue for discussions and debates about complicated social issues like gender identity and we believe in non-government institutions like academia the media uh, religious organizations these are the places where we can figure out these difficult issues uh and unfortunately i think many people in the um in the so-called culture war are reaching to the state to determine these difficult questions uh, libertarians traditionally are conscientious objectors to uh, the culture war, uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, our fellow citizens are, are nonetheless um, waging the war, uh, whether we like it or not. Now, uh, one other element here, uh, people may recall many years ago, the podcast recorded with Sarus Farvar about his uh, book, I believe, Habeas Data was the title of it. And he talks about how courts generally are way behind the curve on uh, technological progress or dealing with it as a legal matter, uh, police are ahead of the curve uh, generally in adopting technologies that make their jobs easier. And uh, we would uh, be perfectly happy with uh, police having an easier job to do unless it implicates uh, basic rights. And uh, police departments, as you note uh, in a re recent blog post, are not particularly transparent about the technologies that they are using, uh, in fact, rarely seeking permission from state lawmakers, instead uh, going ahead with it and uh, seeing where the chips fall. 
That's right. And and this reminds me of the first question you asked, which is uh, the, the, there are beneficial applications of facial recognition that I think libertarians and those who are also concerned about civil liberties should keep in mind. Uh, we, we can look to China and be horrified at the deployment of facial recognition there, but we should keep in mind also that facial recognition can be used, for example, to find missing children or uh, adults with dementia that go missing. And th- those kind of useful applications, I think, should make Make us wary to embrace full-on prohibitions of technologies. Uh, as I've argued before, my, my position is that what's needed is more transparency from police departments about the kind of technology they are using. Far too many Americans find out about new surveillance technologies from journalism outlets rather than local officials. So, so I, I think rather than reaching for bans on technologies, we should argue for more transparency about what technology local police are using, when they use it, what data is involved in making it work uh, and ensuring that the public have a voice uh, in the police that govern or police uh, their local communities. Matthew Feeney directs Cato's project on emerging technologies. Subscribe to and give a rating to the Cato Daily Podcast on your podcast platform of choice and follow us on Twitter at Cato Podcast.